So now we're going to kind of narrow the scope even more, and we're going to talk much more specifically about particular ways uh, in which behaviors are reinforced. And these are more kind of like, oh, these are kind of fail safe, like, oh, barring everything else, barring like, oh, fluctuations, barring all that kind of stuff. This, these events that happen will for sure reinforce a behavior most of the time. The foundation for um, us talking about all these things is the understanding that we all do things for a reason. Okay? Behaviors do not occur in a volume. They, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in, in a vacuum. Okay, They don't exist for no reason at all. We do behaviors for a particular reason. And when we talk about reinforcement, if we can find the reason for that behavior, if we match the consequence, we match what it is to that reason, we're going to reinforce that behavior. The funny thing is, is that most of the time, we actually don't know why we do the things that we do. Like most of the time, we're not even aware of some of the things that we do, okay? And um, uh, the thing is, is that we've been shaped by our environment to behave in the which in the way that we behave. And so when somebody comes up to us and it's like, hey, you know what? I saw you do this. Why did you do it? Okay. Most of the time, we go into our heads and we're like, hmm, well, why did I do that behavior? And so that we start to make up reasons and good excuses for why we engage in a particular behavior. Those are just socially acceptable rationale for why we did it, but that's not the actual reason why we did something. In order for us to look at reinforcing a particular behavior, then we have to be good about identifying, well, what is the purpose of this behavior? Well, what is the reason that this behavior exists? And in the literature, and um, uh, we found that there are four basic functions for behaviors. To our first a big term here, which is the function of a behavior. And so the function of the behavior is the purpose of behavior, why we engage in the behavior. And the four common functions that we find are attention, escape or avoidance, access to tangibles, and sensory stimulation. So we're going to delve into these four functions of behavior today because I think they form the core of what you have to understand about how to effectively change behaviors. So we're gonna start with attention, okay? The thing is, is that we are human beings. And what, what does that mean, okay? We are social animals. We are social beings to the core of us. And that you cannot take that social component out of it, which means that we were born dependent on people, we thrive when we're with other people. The research is absolutely clear about this. When you have a healthy network of people, okay, not Facebook friends, not just social media friends, but when you have a healthy network of people, you are a happier individual overall. And when stress hits you, and you have a better support network, you're more likely to survive that stress. It doesn't actually matter who you're talking about. Everybody enjoys attention, okay? From the most curmudgeon -y, like, oh, I don't like people, I don't like being around people, okay? You put a person on a desert island all by themselves, they will go crazy. <laughs> Okay, there is no way they can remain sane. What is the worst thing you can do to a prisoner in prison? Social isolation. At the heart of it, because we're social beings, attention forms a core part of us thriving. Okay? Now, the thing is, is that when we talk about attention, it can come in any kind of form. Okay? It could be what we consider good attention, 
which is praise and uh, people talking well about us, people patting on us on the back, but it also could come in the form of bad attention, okay? And that's like, oh, people scolding us, people yelling at us, okay? We're talking about all types of attention, not just the good kinds, the bad kinds, it's all types of attention. If a child is engaging in any kind of bad behavior, if they are screaming, if they're crying, and if they're throwing a fit, and what they're looking for is your attention, you giving them attention will reinforce that behavior. Parents tell me all the time, but I'm yelling at them. I'm screaming at them. They, don't, they, they cannot like that, okay? But it doesn't matter about whether or not you think they like it or they don't like it. If they have no other means of getting good social attention, guess what? All kids, all kids, if I can't get good praise, I'm just happy that you notice me. I'm just happy to know that I matter, okay? And when you take a look at all kids, that's what happens, is that if you give them attention for the things that they are good at, if they, you give them attention for that, and it satisfies that need for attention, they don't go and engage in a lot of the inappropriate behaviors. However, when you, when, and this happens all the time when I do assessments, I go to a child's home and the child has a lot of misbehaviors, a lot of bad, bad uh, behaviors. And invariably, oh, when the child's doing something that they should be, parents are just tired and they're like, oh, thank God. Oh, we can finally rest because he's not causing problems, you know? However, when the child does something wrong, no, don't do it. Like, and then everybody is paying a lot of attention to this child when they're doing something wrong. And most of the time, not paying very much attention when they're doing the right things. So whenever a child engages in a behavior that looks for attention, any attention that you give them, be it good attention or bad attention, is going to reinforce that behavior. Why? Because the behavior is looking for attention. Let's talk about the second function of a behavior, okay? The second function, and like I'm not, unfortunately I say first and second, all behaviors serve some sort of function, right? That they serve some sort of purpose, right? It's not as if, okay, this is the first person purpose they fulfilled is the second purpose. No, I, you know, it's not in any particular order. I'm just talking about it in this particular order. So the second function of behavior is escape or avoidance, not like, oh, this is always attention. And then the, the second thing is, it's just that, okay, this is another function of behaviors and it is escape or avoidance escape avoidance then okay well they are opposite sides of the same coin escape is you're already in a situation you don't want to be in and you want to get out of that situation avoidance is oh you see that situation coming and you are trying to avoid that situation altogether we work with uh, a lot of young uh, students here okay and um uh, I meaning like, oh, the staff that we train are mostly college age and things like that. And so with those uh, students, I like to use this kind of example because I think it makes the most sense to them. Um, sometimes you get into a situation where you find out, oh, this person likes me, but I have, I don't ever want to go out with this person, you know? And so you're in a situation where like, okay, I want to avoid them ever asking me out. So what you do is you give them every reason never to ask you out. Oh, I don't date people at work. Oh, I have just come off of a horrible relationship. I never want to date anyone ever again. Oh, like you come up with a wide and you're piling and piling and piling it on so that they never even bother to ask you out. So that's avoidance. Escape is when they've already asked you out, right? Now 
you're in the actual situation. How do I get out of it? Okay. So that's where the escape part comes in. The avoidance part is, let me give you every reason never even to ask me out. You've already asked me out. Now, what do I do to get out of it? Okay. And those are the behaviors that serve the escape function. Escape and avoidance are two sides of the same coin, like I said. And for us, most of the time, we're just going to refer to it as escape, just to keep it simple. But we all do things to get out of doing things we don't want to do. That's a part of what being a human being is. There's things that we don't want to do. And some of us learn how to be very adept at getting out of it. And some of us are very awkward at getting out of stuff that we don't want to do. But we all learn, oh, this is the behavior that is going to get me out of situations. What does that mean in real life situations? Well, let's say, oh, it's time to clean up your toys. All right. You tell your child to clean up the toys and they refuse to do it. They throw themselves on the ground. They cry. They scream. And you don't make them clean up their toys. Okay. Guess what's happened? That behavior has been reinforced. It's been reinforced. Why? Well, they didn't want to clean up their toys and it worked. Whatever I did got you to stop making me clean up my toys. The child, oh, it's time to take a shower. And then they run away and they hide somewhere, but you're too busy to look for them. And so you don't actually make them take a bath until like two or three hours later. Well, what happened? That behavior got them out of that task for the time being. It reinforced the running away and hiding behavior. Third function of behavior is access to tangibles, okay? And access to tang tangibles just means I get something that I want. Really, at the heart of it, that's I get something that I want. And so we all engage in behaviors to get things that we want. So if your child wants a candy and um, they go and snatch it out of another child's hand and they, you let them eat it, guess what? They got what they wanted from that behavior. Me running over and grabbing another child's item and eating it, that got me what I wanted, the item itself. So what am I going to do the next time? I'm going to do the exact same thing. That behavior has been reinforced. The time that the child accesses the things that they want through whatever behaviors that they're engaging in, that behavior is being reinforced. Why? The function of the behavior got met. Oh, my goal for this behavior was to get that thing. And if I get that thing, I'm going to do this behavior more often. Last function of a behavior that we're going to talk about today is sensory stimulation. Okay. And sensory stimulation refers to the enjoyment that we get from all the sensations our brain receives from our senses, from our feelings of touch to our feelings of taste, our smell to our eyesight. It's all the sensations that we get from our body that we enjoy receiving. And so we engage in sensory um, stimulating behaviors, like sensory um, uh, behaviors, because they're enjoyable to us. Okay? Or they help us reduce our anxiety. Is we all, every one of us engages in self stimulatory uh, behavior, self sensory seeking behaviors. Okay. It could be like watching a movie, it could be going and playing basketball, it could be going skiing. It's that we enjoy these things because of the sensory inputs that we get from engaging in those particular behaviors. This happened to learn at a very young age that some of the behaviors we do are really weird and our friends are really going to make fun of us if I do it in front of my friends. So we learn, I'm going to hide these behaviors. I'm only going to do this at home in the privacy of my own room, or we get rid of those behaviors from our repertoire altogether. If you take uh, anybody and you put them in a room that has nothing to do and you keep them in that same place for a long time, let's say like this COVID-19 stuff, we all find really weird things to do at home. Like, because we get so bored out of our minds, we find really strange things to do. 
you know, and you can probably find images of people doing really strange stuff. Why? Because they're just bored and boredom creates a situation where like, okay, rather than being bored, I'd rather lick the walls. Okay. That's what happens is that, oh, when we engage in this because they're enjoyable to us and it's better than being bored. That's a common question that a lot of parents ask me at the very beginning of, of, of treatment is that, oh, my child engages in all of these kind of behaviors. You know, they're flapping their hands or doing all of these kind of um, self-stimulatory type of behaviors. And they're very, very concerned about it. Okay. And I have to tell you, that's the least thing I'm concerned about. Okay. Like it's one of the more embarrassing things, you know, like, oh, when you go out to public and your, your uh, child's doing this or doing that, it's one of the more embarrassing things, but from a treatment side, it's one of the least important things. Why? Because most of the kids that when we start off with them, there's very few things that they can do. There's very few toys they can play with. There's very few activities that actually enjoy. And so then that's why you have so much self-stimulatory behavior, because if I don't have anything else that I enjoy that much, it's more enjoyable for me to spin this plate or to flap my hands or to do all of these kind of behaviors, because that's better than being bored. And so as a process of treatment, you're trying to teach them and give them skills to engage in higher level types of enjoyable activities so that, oh, you know what? I'd rather go watch a movie. I'd rather go play with a toy. I'd rather go do this because it has more enjoyment and more value to it than me just flapping my hands here. Now, this is a, a one final point about the self uh, stimulation. And it has to do with something that I touched on before, which is it reduces anxiety, right? Now, the thing is, is that um, if you take a look at people that have uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Like, and um, so what happens is that, you know, they engage in a wide variety of behaviors to um, ease their anxiety, you know? So, and you can see, oh, as um, stressors hit, you know, oh, as um, uh, more and more things bother them as more and more things like go wrong in their lives. What happens is that these um, compulsive behaviors skyrocket. They go through the roof, right? They're hand washing. They do a lot more of, they, they engage in a wide variety of behaviors. And for them, what's happening is like engaging in these behaviors calms me down. It makes me feel better by engaging in these behaviors, okay? the same thing happens with your kids. When they are afraid of something, when they're anxious about something, you should see their self-stimulatory behaviors increase. Their flapping increases, their rocking increases, okay? And all of those self-stimulating type of behaviors calm them down. It serves as a mechanism to fight off the fear and fight off the anxiety. So um, that concludes our talk uh, for today. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. Uh, next week, we're going to delve a little bit more into some of the other terms like positive and negative reinforcement and punishment so that everyone kind of um, has a broader understanding of it. So hopefully, everyone will join us. Uh, if uh, you like what we do, please hit the like button. Um, if you really enjoy what we do and want to keep up with what we're doing, please subscribe. And like always, um, uh, any feedback is uh, appreciated. We'll see everybody next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.